Well, hello there, everyone. This is Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web presentation for June the 11th, 2020. After a brief week hiatus, uh, thanks to Beth for taking over and doing the Forage ID uh, presentation last week. Hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, it'd be a great resource to go back to and look at and uh, figure out what forages are on your farm. And just goes in with uh, all the talk I've had with you guys about diversity and getting diversity into your pastures. Hopefully you're seeing lots of diversity here this spring. Uh, realize this week's topic is surviving the spring flush. And, and I do realize that we're probably a week or two late on this. Um, probably should have been doing it the week we did the virtual pasture walk and then probably should have been doing it last week. But I was ready for a break and I uh, was glad that Beth had got that web presentation put together. So we're going to go ahead and get started talking about how to survive the spring flush. First, though, I think it's good for us to talk a little bit about what the spring flush is. Maybe for those of you who haven't come to any of our Eastern Ohio Grazing Council events or are new to management intensive grazing, but the spring flush is basically that early time period here, usually end of May, 1st of June, when uh, everything is just growing like crazy. And, and if you look at your yard and how you have to mow your yard this time of year, about two or three times a week to keep it in any kind of shape, uh, that's the spring flush. It, it's just a, a massive uh, growth curve. And uh, it, it is the time when all of our forage seems to be wanting to put on a seed head and reproduce. And that's a good point because that is our forage's main goal is to grow up and produce a seed so that it continues the species, so to speak. Uh, later in the year, if we've done our job and, and managed our forage and kept the seed heads from forming, that forage plant, be it grass or legume or forb, will eventually go into survival mode and, and they'll put down roots and, and put down uh, energy that will keep it through the winter time and allow it to regrow next spring. But this time of year is when that grass is, forage is really trying to make seed and, and, and reproduce. And, and, and our goal as grazers is to keep it. To re from reproducing in some instances, although we'll talk a minute about why we might want to let it reproduce here in a future slide. But for the most part, we want to keep it from reproducing, keeping it from making seed, because if our forage plants make seed, then they're kind of done for the season. They, they don't produce a whole lot of forage after that. Will they produce some? Sure, they'll produce some because they're going to go into that survival mode that I was talking about, uh, but they're not going to have to to survive as much because they've produced the seed and and they for, as far as they're concerned have furthered their species by putting out seed that new plants will grow so it's a time for us to manage our pastures carefully uh, we want to try to keep them from going to seed we want to keep them vegetative instead of going into reproduction now there's there's a point here at which where reproduction has gone too far and, and they're already going to make seed and there's a point at which where it's just starting to reproduce and we want to keep it right kind of in that just starting to to go into that seed head mode very difficult time to manage um this is probably the hardest time for a grazer uh is is being able to keep those seed heads at bay and and, and i'm here to tell you for those of you that are new uh, it's a losing battle because we can hardly ever keep ahead of the seed heads but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Uh, there are ways and, and things that we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes uh, to help us manage and kind of keep ahead of those seed heads. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, there, like I said, there are going to be reasons why we want them to make seed if for some reason. And we'll talk about that as we go along. First option I have listed here uh, is making hay. And if y'all know me, I, I typically put my slides kind of in order of, of the way I, I like to think about them. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily the case today, so uh, don't hold your horses here a minute and, and let's talk about the options just as they are. Uh, we can go out and we can pick a certain amount of our pasture and we can make hay. Almost all of us have pasture uh, that we can go out and, and mow and be able to make hay safely. Now, Realizing that we are in Eastern Ohio and there are some very steep pastures out there and there are some pastures that we just wouldn't make hay no matter what. And uh, this is all contingent on the fact that you have the hay making equipment at your disposal to be able to make hay. Uh, there are plenty of you out there that don't have hay and I applaud, don't have hay equipment and I applaud you for that. 
Uh, we've been talking about that in Eastern Ohio Grazing Council meetings for a long, long time. And so we'll have options here coming up for those of you who don't have hay making equipment. But for those of you that do, uh, we can go out and make some hay and kind of get that pasture back in the vegetative state. But it's going to take some planning. We don't want to go out there and mow down a whole lot of hay and then find out a week later that we mowed down too much if we don't have anything left for the cows to graze. Uh, I, I purposely stay away from the making hay topic. About 10 years ago, uh, Dad and I discussed making some hay. We were having a spring just like this spring. We just had tons of growth and everything was in seed all at one time. And uh, we talked about making hay. I went to work. I came back and every single acre, I think, that Dad could get a tractor on, he mowed down for hay. And the bad part about that was the cows were just about to leave the fields that we couldn't make for hay. So for about two weeks, I was struggling trying to find enough forage to be able to keep the cows fed. Uh, part of the benefit of management intensive grazing is our cows do most of the work for us. We don't have to feed them diesel fuel to be able to make them work. But part of the real problem is we also can't stop them. They keep eating no matter what. We can't shut them down. So we have to make sure we have enough forage to get through until that hay, that mowed field will grow back. So my suggestion to you is figure out how much your cows are using either in days or weeks or however you measure it and make sure that you have that 30 to 45 day um, stockpile or bank of forage ahead of you. And then whatever acres are extra or left over, then that could certainly be made for hay. Now at that point also, we wanna make sure that we don't mow it too close. We've done a good job at managing our pasture and we've done a good job about talking about leaving a residue. Uh, we don't wanna mow those fields any lower than we would allow our cattle to graze them. Uh, four inches is, is for most forages, orchard grasses, fescues, the tall grasses. Uh, if it's bluegrass, we certainly could go a little bit lower. I would be a proponent though of mowing hay just a little bit taller. And the reason for that is that scythe or sickle or whatever you're cutting the hay with uh, is going to be a clean cut. It's not going to be like the cows grazing it. The cows kind of rip and tear. And, and in my experience, the forage tends to come back easier from that ripping and tearing. And also, they have yet to figure out how to put a manure spreader behind a hay bind. That cow is spreading manure. And so manure and urine is going to help that forage to regrow the next time where if we're mowing it off with a with a mower of some sort that cow isn't leaving saliva on the forage it's also not leaving manure and urine behind to help grow but making hay is definitely an option uh, in this spring flush for those of you that don't have hay mowing equipment uh, this one's for you i guess and even for those of us who do we may have a field that just isn't right, just isn't going to be enough to mow and, and it's just not right. Maybe we've abused it too much in the winter or the spring, and maybe that field just needs clipped or mowed or brush hogged or whatever you want to say. Maybe it just needs knocked down and the forage left on the soil surface to help regenerate and regrow new forage to help our soil. Uh, this is a perfectly good option. We can go out there and clip or mow. Again, don't see it as waste. We're not wasting that forage. That forage is going to be left and, and help us to build soil to help us fertility or build fertility. Also to help us capture more rain if things get dry here in a few weeks, which is something we always have to be vigilant about this time of year. Uh, one word of caution, though, if we're going to do that, especially in a heavy field, it can create some bare or slow growing areas, especially if we've used a disc bind or something that's going to windrow that hay. So we need to make sure that we kind of get it spread out. And, and that's where a brush hog or a, a regular disc mower with no rolls kind of comes in. It's, it's easier to do with that. The good thing about clipping, mowing, and even baling hay that I just talked about is that that mowing will kind of set the grazing height for the future because if we mow it to four inches, that four inch stump is going to tend to get mature and, and thick. And those cows or sheep or whatever aren't going to want to graze that forage any lower than that for, for pretty much the rest of the season. Again, we want to control that mowing height. Four inches is probably the, the shortest mowing height I'd want to go with if we were going to clip or brush hog or, or mow those fields. And, and like I said, just we, we can't see that as waste. It's not waste 
Uh, waste not, want not, that foliage will, will lay on the soil surface, will shield our soil from the sunlight and help us to capture more rain, not to mention the benefits they'll have on the soil biology. This is kind of my own idea as I was putting this presentation together and kind of, kind of some of the things I'm doing at home uh, with, with grazing. Uh, you all know that, that I'm a, a lifelong high stocking density grazing proponent. And we're going to talk about that here in the next slide. But for those of us that can't or won't or, or don't have the ability, the time, the resources, whatever, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to, to use high stocking density grazing to your advantage. Uh, one thing that, that I think we could think about is just grazing through. Graze through those fields. If they're ahead of you, you don't have the haymaking ability or time or weather, maybe we should just graze through those fields and, and keep our rotation going. Uh, then we can come back and, and use the brush hog, the clipper, the mower, the, the disc mower, whatever, and clip those fields. The reason we may think about doing this is because that cow or sheep or goat or whatever is going to select the forage that best suits their needs. They're going to select the high energy, take the tips just off the grass, and it's never going to look like what it sounds. You're hardly going to be able to tell that they took the tips off, but they are. And that's very, very high energy forage. So the cows or sheep or whatever grazing animal we're talking about are going to get the best stuff out of that field. And then the, the mower will get the, the less quality stuff and put it down on the soil surface for us for future grazings, hopefully, for fertility and rain capture and all those things that we talk about. Um, this will substantially increase the gains on our livestock because we've allowed them to select what forage they want to eat and move them on. Um, and then it, it will also you know, leave that residue out there on the soil surface, just like we talked about. Um, I, I think that a lot of us could graze through pastures and clip it and see just as much benefit, if not more, than just going out and clipping a field or, or mowing a field for hay. I, as you can tell, I, I'm not a great proponent of mowing for hay. You could even mow these fields that you've grazed through for hay if you so choose. It would be lower quality stuff, maybe something you wanna use for bedding. It may be something I would use like in my deep bedded hog barn, why not? Uh, it would be sort of a more stemmy, strawy kind of kind of forage, but it could be done. So I think for some of us that are on a seven day move or a three day move and we don't have the time to move animals like I do or like I choose to, uh, just grazing through those fields and coming back and clipping them could be a, a great way to manage the spring flush. Of course, if you all know me, you know I had to throw in the high stocking density grazing and I know I did a web presentation on this a couple of weeks ago. It's because I'm, I'm very excited about the results that I see and that I get from high stocking density grazing. I'm also um, very interested in some changes that I've made to the way that I've, I've grazed them. I, I, I admittedly was grazing them too short, pounding them too hard and not leaving enough residue when I left. Uh, I am correcting that this summer and I am already amazed at the results. Uh, we grazed the field with the sheep and stalker steers the other day. Uh, we got a, about an inch and a half rain, maybe a little less. Two days later, I went out and the clover was already four or five inches high from where the, the sheep and the calves had stomped it. So uh, the, the results that I'm seeing now are even better than the results that I've been seeing for, for a long, long time. But it's sort of a, a, a hybrid system of grazing. You know, you're trying to make those pastures small, trying to get a high stocking density and trying to move them on. Yes, I'm moving them during the weekend, sometimes every two hours, uh, because I'm trying to learn what is the right amount of trample and the right amount of size. It's, it's a really thinking person's kind of game and making things work. But when I get done high stocking density grazing, there's nothing left to mow. And that's not to mean there's no forage out there. There's tons of forage out there on the soil surface, but there's nothing left for me to take, go take a brush hog to because they've trampled it all. If I've done my job right, it, it's all been trampled. And in everywhere that that grass plant or forage plant gets trampled, it kinks the stem. Once it's kinked the stem or leaf blade, that leaf is then going to die and fall to the soil surface, even though it's already there, and become litter on the soil surface. So it, 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 high stocking density is a hard thing to balance and hard thing to get right. But you can really make an impact on your soil health. You can really make an impact on your pastures by trying some of it out. 
uh, the, the hard thing I have, and the reason why I have to consider multiple options is even if I'm, even though I'm high stocking density grazing, I'm turning them into smaller pastures, I'm moving them multiple times a day. I have a hard time covering the required amount of acres. I figure I need to be covering about two acres a day to be able to get ahead of the seed heads. Right now, I'm only covering about an acre and a half. So I've got to employ some of those other management strategies to help me keep that forage vegetative. I mentioned in an earlier slide that we may want to let some of those plants go to seed. And there may be reasons why we would do that. And we would call that kind of a deferred grazing type of situation. We may be letting a field go full mature uh, for a certain reason, but it, it'll allow those plants to grow up, get fully mature, their roots to get fully mature, the plant to get fully mature, the plant to go to seed. So this will allow newly seeded forages, if we've seeded a new field, to completely get their life cycle in, to, to be able to go grow up and, and get a seed head established. Uh, it, it, it is also going to help add seeds to the seed bank. You know, if we've got a field that's particularly good forage and we'd like to see more of that in the field or an area of a field that was particularly good forage and, and we want to let that go, grow up and go to seed and, and it go to our seed bank to help us get more of that plant. Uh, it's amazing what this will do. I, I'll, I'm here to tell you that I mean, we defer a little bit of our pasture every year, probably more last year than we will this year, but we started seeding red clover again here the last two or three years with a vengeance and I've got red clover in fields that I, I, I didn't plant it so uh, it's because I've left some of those fields kind of deferred and let them go to seed that we're getting that now this can go the other way if we've got a, a massive weed problem in a field and we defer it uh, that weed problem is only going to get worse so we have to be concerned about that if we've got a, a noxious weed or something we don't want out there in our pasture we really don't want to let that go to seed. Um, this, this can be a more cost effective way, you know, than, than mowing or baling hay. Uh, if diesel fuel were really expensive or we don't have the hay equipment, which I mean, diesel fuel is always really expensive in my mind. Uh, this may be a cost effective way to help add seed to the seed bank and to leave that forage quality is going to be terrible when we finally get to it. There is no doubt. Although, is it going to be more terrible than some of the hay that we're going to get made? Um, We've had some good weather here this week to make hay. We'll have some good weather again, but it, it, if we follow our normal weather pattern, usually we're going to have a lot of hay that's going to get almost this mature anyway before we're going to before we're going to make it as hay and feed it to the cows. So, what's the difference in feeding them over mature hay or allowing them to graze it later on in the summer? The last word of caution for this is, uh, again, we let that plant go to seed, so we will see a reduced subsequent growth. Uh, that, that plant has already made seed. It's only going to go into survival mode then for the rest of the year, and it's not going to continue to make a whole lot of vegetation. Uh, it will make some, don't get me wrong, it will, uh, but it will make way more if we had kept ahead of the seed head. But deferred grazing is an option. If, if that's the tool you have to, to, to get your pasture or keep your pasture right, you can keep the other parts of your pasture vegetative while leaving this one, this deferred area kind of grow up, go to seed, and put down really strong roots. I didn't want to leave this spring flush topic without talking a minute about summer annuals. Right now we're all faced with, we've got more forage than we ever would know what to do with. But in a month, or 45 days or 60 days, we may be on the other end of that spectrum, and it can happen fast. And so if there's ever a time that any of you are considering planting some summer annuals, uh, now is that time. Before I go too far into that, though, I will say, if, if you don't have more forage right now than you can handle, then it's time to start taking a hard look at your stocking rate and how many cows or sheep or goats you have on the pasture. If we don't have enough forage right now, that means we're overstocked. So there's just no two ways to put it. Uh, summer annuals aren't going to bail you out of that, unfortunately. Uh, if, if we've got too many or we've got too much livestock pressure, this time of year we're, we're in trouble and we've got to do something different but if we're if we've got enough forage right now and we want to to really graze a field mob graze a field high stocking density graze a field uh, even if we want to make a field for hay and go back and plant some summer annuals we're, we're getting on to that time in fact we're probably past that time not to say that we couldn't still do it i'm just saying that we could have done it two or three weeks ago even 
Uh, we can plant things like sorghum sedan, pearl millet, soybeans, grazing corn, and there are many, many, many other ones. There's many, many mixes of summer annuals that we can plant out there in the field. For the most part, we'd like to drill them, no-till drill them into pasture if, if that's what we're going to do. Uh, we may even want to graze it, no-till it, and then we, we, if we really want to make sure that it's going to, to go good, we, we can think about going back and brush hogging that field in a week or two when those seeds start to emerge just to help it kind of get ahead. My experience is sorghum sedan and some of the other ones, they're, they're so good, they'll get ahead of it anyway, so we don't need to. We can also go, go out and broadcast it. We were at Hans uh, Balsley's place last fall, and he had done some broadcasting of sorghum sedan and, and had a good stand of it. So uh, I, I would say that it's a good thing to go out there and try, try one or the other or even both and see which one you get a better stand from and, and whether it was cost effective. You know, we, we got to figure that running that drill isn't free so we have to figure out what's the most cost effective for us considering fuel and seed price and all those things and uh and one other word of caution for planting summer annuals we we need to if we're going to plant them into perennial pastures we need to be watching our residue heights uh, we may want to graze that just a little harder than we normally would uh, to be able to make sure that those newly planted seeds are going to come up and then the seed to soil contact is very important if we're going to drill it uh, one, we need to pay attention to how deep we're drilling it. For the most part, these summer annuals don't need to be that deep. We, we've got all the charts here at NRCS that'll tell you how deep they need to be. Uh, but we need to have seed to soil contact. That doesn't mean it needs to be buried really deep. And I, I put this picture on here as a background. This is my favorite summer annual. That's all weeds. Uh, but it is a weed that the cows ate and it was a summer annual kind of weed. So. Uh, it's kind of my favorite picture for, for putting in for summer annuals until I get a really good stand of summer annuals out there in the field, which I'm planning on doing here this summer. Well, after talking over all those options for surviving the spring flush, I hope you all realize that uh, I'm in no way saying that you need to pick one way to manage your forage for the spring flush. I think the best way to manage the spring flush is to go at it in a multitude of ways and try different things and and do different strategies on different parts of the farm in order to get through. Uh, I know for me personally, and I probably mentioned this in the slide set, but uh, I'm doing several different kinds, different things, because I can't get the cows to go over the whole farm and get the forage back in vegetative shape in the time that, that I want to do it. I want to do it here in the next 30, 45 days before everything turns brown and, and dries and dies off on me. So with that little piece of information, that's a wrap for this week's web presentation. As always, we'll end by thanking our sponsors and thanking all of you for tuning in and sending in your kind comments and, and suggestions and topics. We do appreciate it. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.